Well, good morning. My name is Peter Hay. I'm the pastor here at the Wilmington United Methodist Church, and I bid you welcome as we gather to worship our God, to celebrate our faith, and to renew our commitment to live our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. It's also a joy and a pleasure to welcome Bonnie Barton to, with us today. Bonnie and I uh, uh, share together the ministry in Tewksbury, and uh, she's, uh, she preached this morning up in Tewksbury and has done a wonderful job and has uh, graciously offered to share her message here today, which has been very helpful because I was able to completely organize the uh, rest of the Holy Week services this week, and uh, I also got my taxes done. So Bonnie, <laughs> the federal government thanks you. Now, as is our custom, I invite us to sit prayerfully and be attentive to God's spirit as uh, Ben offers the morning prelude. Good morning. Please rise as you are able for the call to worship. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Our opening hymn is number 278, Hosanna, loud Hosanna, found in the red hymnal.
You may be seated. Please join me in the opening prayer. Almighty God, God on this day, your, your Son, Jesus, Jesus Christ, entered, entered the holy city of Jerusalem and was proclaimed king by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. Let, Let those branches be for us signs of his victory, victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our Lord and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. In his name we pray. Amen. But before we have our children's time, I, uh, I want to do something very special. Caitlin, would you join me up front, please? Yes. <laughs> I got a message from Caitlin this week telling me that uh, she bought a Bible. And uh, she said she's going to bring it with her to church, and she's going to bring it to the worship services that she helps with every uh, Tuesday morning at um, Windsor Place. So I thought I'd call her forward and uh, offer a prayer of blessing for our sister as uh, she's undergoing a wonderful new phase in her life. Her spirituality is awakening and her life as a disciple is coming to blossom. And I never forget the day when we laid our hands on Gus for prayer. You were standing right next to me and there was radiating from your spirit a whole bunch of faith and love and goodwill. So I rejoice with you that you're a part of us and would ask you to hold your Bible in your hands. Almighty God, we give you thanks. And we pray that our sister would continue to grow in her faith, learning about your love and your grace, that her spirit might be shaped after the example of Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. Uh, we love you. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll invite our young folks forward if they'd like to join me for our time for the young and for the young at heart. Feel free to bring a palm branch if you've got one. <laughs> going to have a seat. We can gather around before we have a a triumphant exit from the sanctuary. Hello, hello. <clears throat> All right. So, who remembers what season we're in? In the church. March, that's close. March Madness is another. We can be in one of the different time. Yeah. Spring. What was that? Oh, yeah. So, did, how about anyone heard of Lent? Yeah. No? Yeah, we've heard of Lent, some of us. Lent is a season right before Easter. And Lent kind of goes through some of March Madness. It goes through some of spring. It goes through March. But we can be in multiple seasons at once. Lent is a, a really kind of particularly uh, church season or holiday. And I think that's wonderful that it's a time that we can gather here as followers of Christ and as church people and have a special time that we gather. And it's a season where we prepare for uh, Easter. And it begins with Ash Wednesday. Do any of you remember Ash Wednesday? We had a pretty small service. I don't know if any of you were here for it. But it's what we kick off Lent with. And then today, it's not quite Easter. Does anyone know what today is? There's hints. Palm Sunday, yeah. And so on Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. What was that? Nice. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, we're going to have a fun Easter hunt around the church next week. 
But for now, we are celebrating Palm Sunday. And do you know how they celebrated Palm Sunday in the Bible? They had a little bit of a parade when Jesus enters Jerusalem. How many of you have been to a parade? What are some things we throw parades for? Um, Halloween. Halloween parade? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving parade, yeah. Um, a pumpkin. A pumpkin, yeah. Have kind of a fall time parade. Fourth of July parade. Holidays. Holidays. Have you ever been to and cake? We could have a cake parade. I'd go to that. <laughs> and candles, yeah. Have you ever been to and Donegan and I got spoiled when we moved to Boston because we moved here in 2018. And in 2018, there was one day where I was going to class and I had to miss class because we don't really follow football all that much. But on my way to class, we ran into a parade after the Patriots won the Super Bowl. And we all welcomed them home. It's not a holiday, but it might as well be in Boston. And then in 2018, in the spring, I had to miss another class because we were headed there and I ran into a big crowd when I was trying to change from the orange line at Back Bay to the green line at Copley. And I ran into a big crowd for the the Red Sox, I almost said the Red Hawks is the Oklahoma B-League uh, baseball team. Oh. Oh, yeah. And so we have big parades when we welcome our sports teams home triumphantly. But Jesus, he was coming into Jerusalem and they wanted to welcome him triumphantly, but they didn't make a big deal out of it. Jesus wasn't big money like sports teams, so they grabbed what they had. They Palm branches. They had their cloaks to wave in the air. Do we have some pieces of fabric I see? Yeah, they, they celebrated. So we're going to, on our way out to Sunday school, we're going to take a little detour. We're going to make our own parade, and we're going to do one loop around the sanctuary, and then we're going to go out down the middle and go downstairs to Sunday school. And there's a word that the people said when Jesus, we've said it a few times in our songs and in our prayers. Have you heard it? I've heard Hope say it. Hope, what do you say when you wave your palm branch? Hosanna. Can we all wave our palm branches or our, our fabrics or our hands and say Hosanna? And we'll invite the people here. I'll lead our parade. Donegan's gonna bring up the, the caboose of the parade and we'll make a, a Hosanna parade. We'll go around the sanctuary and out the back doors. Sound good? Yep. Hosanna! That was delightful. Well, may the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you.
from Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 through 12. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, triumphant and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you, you double. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Grace and peace, friends, brothers and sisters in the faith, we are gathered here today for Palm Sunday, and I give gratitude to your pastor, Peter, for allowing me to share the pulpit and message with you this morning. Begin with a prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of, my, of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. The sermon title is High Hopes and Big Disappointments. This is a season of navigating a biblical story that has both highs and lows, but today we celebrate Palm Sunday. Now, the passage that you just heard is not your typical Palm Sunday passage. It's the Zechariah passage foretelling the Palm Sunday story. And in a minute, Peter will lead us uh, in the reading of, someone will read us in the leading of that uh, traditional Luke passage. But for the moment, I want us to linger in Zechariah's prophecy. This scripture passage is dated nearly 500 years before Jesus' ministry. And it sure sounds an awful lot like what we understand Palm Sunday events. Today we're going to start our Palm Sunday journey by lingering in the Old Testament so that we can then hear the New Testament passage with new ears. You know, this passage from Zechariah talks about visions and prophecies about rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple, the gathering and the triumphs of the scattered Israeli people, which seems especially poignant during this season of violence in the Middle East world. Zechariah's prophecies describe a savior with a mortal ministry who returns in triumph and glory from death. In Zechariah's passage, fragile people like us are promised a stable future. He promises a people without a king that they will soon have a king. They can celebrate and rejoice because their king is coming to rule and bring peace throughout the world. I hear an expectation of hope and affirmation of Jesus' own words, thy kingdom come on earth as in heaven. Is there a phrase in this pasture, this scripture pasture, the passage that jumped out at you? Uh, it talks about chariots, battle bows, and commanding peace, blood of the covenant, setting prisoners free from the waterless pit, prisoners of hope. 
So anything that resonated for you, I hope you'll go back and read it again. There's a lot of powerful imagery in this passage. For me, the phrase prisoners of hope jumps out. Sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? So I decided I better explore it. I started with the question, what is the definition of hope? Kind of a funny word and an unclear emotion, isn't it? Is it a yearning for something? Or is hope a promise? During Advent, we talk about peace, love, joy. Those kind of make sense. Those are words we understand their meanings. And hope. I think hope's a little more mysterious. And what in the world is a prisoner of hope? I hope it means that someone is so convicted of the power of hope that one believes anything is possible. Our faith invites us to be prisoners of hope that Jesus is our Savior and he is the King of peace. So I continued to look up definitions of hope and I discovered these gems. First, definition is that hope is a feeling of expectation and desire of a certain thing. Maybe like, I hope I get that job. I hope to see she, he, her, him, them at church. I hope the stock market goes up some more. That feels like wishing, doesn't it? So I wasn't satisfied with that definition, and I found another one. Hope is an optimistic state of mind that is based on our expectation of positive outcomes with respect to events circumstances in our life or in the world at large. I like that better even though it's a long sentence because I hear in that definition that hope is a choice. I wonder if we really understand how much power we have to choose and what happens when we choose hope over worry, despair, disappointment, sorrow. Maybe hope is our superpower our antidote, our vaccine. When used as a verb, Wikipedia has this definition of hope. It includes expect with confidence and to cherish a desire with anticipation. It's a mindset. It's a choice. We can expect lots of things, right? We expect lots of things that's very different to expect Confidence, wouldn't we? We can cherish a desire with lots of different emotions. Doesn't it feel engaging and exciting to cherish a desire? Whether that's a desire for a meal or for a team to win or for a friend to call or visit. And we add a dose of anticipation. Kind of brings it up a notch. Hope with anticipation. Now, Zechariah is prophesying a king with hopeful anticipation. He's proposing a hopeful mindset. You know, there's lots of talk today about the power of our mindset, right? Brain power. And the power we have to select our mindset and the impact that our chosen mindset has on our lives and our activities. When I was in high school, I was a diver jumping off that little board up into the air and flipping around backwards, inwards, sideways, twisting. I'm not really sure how I did that. But I know that I rehearsed every night, every dive in my mind. I replayed them over and over again in my mind. I'm not sure exactly how I executed some of those dives, but I knew them in my mind's eye so they became real in the actions of my body. Research has confirmed that mental rehearsal, have many of you ever done that? Give me a hand up if you practice mental rehearsal. Picturing yourself going through a routine or preparation for a competition or activity, that mental rehearsal actually improves the performance by preparing the mind and the body for a desired action. So how does that connect to Palm Sunday? I believe that the actions that we are taking today and each year when we celebrate Palm Sunday, 
is one of the ways we as people of faith practice choosing a mindset of hope. It's a choice we make to open ourselves up to the biblical passion story and to walk together through the coming Holy Week. Just being open to what God might reveal to us is choosing hope. Today, do you agree with me? Today, we do not know for certain whether there will be an Easter in seven days. But we take the journey anyways with the hope for a positive outcome. And jelly beans, and chocolate eggs, and marshmallow peeps, right? Some of you like those. However, sometimes we don't always get the outcome we pray for. We find ourselves in the winter doldrums or overwhelmed by our circumstances or facing life-threatening challenges. Or even in a waterless pit, as Zechariah described. What is a waterless pit? I looked it up, and here's what I found. Waterless pits would have been familiar in the uh, biblical times. Because, for example, it's what Joseph was thrown into by his brothers when they wanted to get rid of him. He was thrown in the waterless pit to die. But the brothers decided they did not want to have Joseph's blood on their hands, so they decided to sell him into slavery. Is there any hope in Joseph's story? I think so. I wonder if it was Joseph's mindset of hope that empowered him to work hard and seemingly believe that his life could get better. If you know the story, whether it was by faith or luck or perseverance, Joseph certainly experienced a positive outcome rising uh, to a position of leadership and respect. Believing in a God through whom all things are possible seems to me to suggest that hope is a necessary and positive part of faith. So what do you hope for? Here are a couple examples, and then I'll create space for you to share also. I hope last week I did my parents' taxes correctly. <laughs> Until I hear otherwise, I choose to believe that all is well, and that if anything is wrong, I will be able to deal with it. Now, I could let worrying about a call from the IRS or a letter from the IRS disrupt my sleep or not. I'm choosing Hope. There's also great research about the power of generosity as hope in action, with the expectation of a positive outcome. I love the stories of people managing health conditions and challenges with acts of kindness and generosity. I believe hope is also a healing power. There's a great story about a woman who had MS, and she chose to spend 40 days doing random acts of kindness and caring for others and being generous, whether it was a piece of cake or, or whether it was a dropping some coins in the Salvation Army bucket. And at the end of that 40 days, the doctors were amazed. He was managing a challenging life situation with courage and vigor that they had not, uh, they could not figure out where this miracle was happening. For it is in giving that we receive. It's our faithful leaps of gener generosity by giving sometimes more than we think is possible or rational even. That is about hope. I want to create space for any of you to share. Is there something that you hope for that you can see that having a positive attitude has an impact on the way your hope shows up? Word from the body. We hope, we hope we take better care of our planet to encourage, make it hospitable for those who come after us, even for us. That is a, that's a hope that we step into by taking action, right? It's not just a wish, it's a hope that we're invited to participate in. Those are hopes. You shared earlier the hope that we continue as a denomination to really practice being open, welcoming, and affirming of all of God's children. It's a hope that we put into practice through the actions that we take. 
I invite you to keep thinking about your hopes, whether they're wishes or whether they're calls to action for you and your life. The passage from Zechariah, I believe, is really about hope. It's about a future unfolding and a promise. It gives us something to look forward to. That is hope. Now we're going to hear the familiar Luke passage of Jesus' entry into the city of Jerusalem and reflect on some aspects of that experience. After he said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on the colt, and he rode along. People kept spreading their cloaks on the road. And now as he was approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. But he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout Can you hear the connections between the Zechariah passage and the Luke passage? Jesus orchestrates his entry into Jerusalem to fulfill Zechariah's prophecy. I wonder how Jesus really felt as he entered Jerusalem. What was his mindset? Probably a mixture of hope and dread. But the crowd, right? The crowd got excited. The disciples got excited and celebrated. Can't you just see it as Jameson was talking about earlier with the children? What happens in, in our spaces, in our communities, when champions arrive in town, when sports folks you know, are nodding that, yeah, we get excited, right? We get energized. So we've got this Palm Sunday experience, Jesus arriving, and a whole bunch of other people catching the fever, getting excited about the possibility of Jesus being their king. Jesus was defined in that moment as a champion. So who are some of the champions that we celebrate in our current culture? Get into the air. Who are some of the champions that we get excited or jazzed about being here? You know it. Speak it. I don't have to speak it for you. Teachers, rock stars. How specific? I'm looking for a name. Martin Luther King and Tom Brady, right, okay? So imagine, <laughs> Im imagine what would happen. How would we feel if Tom Brady or even the resurrection of Martin Luther King walked into our parking lot? We would all be at the window, right? Can you, and what would we be doing? We'd be trying to get autographs. We'd be trying to get close. Can you feel the fever? Can you feel the energy? When we as a culture identify other people as champions, they, we get goosebumps, right? We get excited, we get energized. We want to be close to that space, to that moment. They were hopeful. They were waving palm branches, they were making noise, and we want to celebrate. 
At the same time, we know that Jesus knew Zechariah's prophecy, including the part about the Savior's mortal ministry, the end of it, and final return in glory. I want you to notice something about this passage. The way that Jesus enters the city matters. Not only does it echo the Old Testament prophecy, but it also gives us some important clues about how the message that Jesus was bringing to us. Because peace comes on a donkey. There are ancient writings like Homer and Aesop's fable, or even the donkey in Shrek, for example, <laughs> that are depicted as servile, stubborn, stupid, and even a little silly. Look at this face. <laughs> However, the biblical imagery of donkeys is that they are symbols of humility and peace, suffering and service. Biblical donkeys are humble, peaceful, and straightforward. Now, tradition, the tradition was that if you entered the city on a donkey, you were coming in as a symbol of peace, rather than on a wage warring, than as a wage warring king arriving on a horse. Jesus chose a donkey, just as the uh, prophecy suggested. The animal of peace, rather than a horse, which was the animal of war and power. Entering the city on a donkey instead of the horse showed, as one source cites, that Jesus was against using violence for power. I love the image of Jesus being our first identified advocate for peace and reconciliation. He orchestrated his arrival with a message of peace rather than power. Jesus was an advocate for nonviolence in social change and justice for all. Here's one more piece of this amazing story. Traditionally, people dismounted before entering Jerusalem out of respect for the sanctity of the city. Jesus deliberately rides in on that donkey to identify himself as a king, yet as a humble king of peace. Yet still, right, the crowd went wild hoping he might claim his power and rescue us rather than share it with all of us. I believe to this day, Jesus waits for us to use our power to create peace and to share it with others. Even as we sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna, and call him Lord of all, he wants us to be the champions of peace. Today, we choose to welcome the King of Peace as he enters our lives in the manner that he sees fit, reminding us of our power to choose hope even when passion shifts from Hosanna to crucify him. This is the time, this is the perfect space and the place for hope to center our hearts and minds, to create peace for even a moment, for God is in this moment. As forgiven and forgiving people, let us offer up our gifts.
accept, Almighty God, these gifts which we, your people, offer, each an expression of love and of longing, a love for you, and a longing to be a part of your healing work in the world. Bless all that we've offered and guide who we become. Amen. Won't you please be seated? I would now invite us to uh, share the joys and concerns. Uh, we didn't get any yellow cards this morning, so uh, if you, uh, we, we do have, that option is available to you. You'll find them in the pew rack. Ah. <laughs> I stand corrected. Are there other uh, joys or concerns that people would like to share? You, please share it aloud and then I'll repeat it so we can all hear. And uh, if you have more than one, please pause between them so I can repeat them. I'll be a little more accurate that way. Yes, Bernice. My niece has finally stopped chemo after a year. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Bernice's niece has completed uh, her course in chemo for a year. That's wonderful. Yes, Sam. Yeah, prayers for Sam's dad. He's in the, uh, in the hospital uh, in Winchester with pneumonia. And uh, we prayed for him in Tewksbury this morning as well. So, yeah. Yes, Bev. Uh, continued prayers for our brother John Bishop as he hosts homeless week after three months. We're keeping John Bishop in our prayers. We've been praying for him every Sunday for quite a number of weeks now. And we'll, we'll continue that. Thank you, Bev. Okay. Prayers for Heather as she's having some medical issues and also for your nephew, George. Yes. Oh, Ann just shared with me that her sister has been, uh, sister-in-law has been diagnosed with stage four cancer. So we are so sorry to hear that and assure her of our love and of our prayers. I saw another hand. Yes, Ginny. Prayers for Marge as she had a heart attack. Yes, Ed? Prayers for Nick Rideout as he's Ruth King's nephew and has esophageal cancer. Al? Uh, Al, we're very So, Hal, you're having surgery on Tuesday. We will hold you in our prayers and uh, in our love. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, prayers for John. Uh, Bev shared that a few moments ago. So we, we shall pray all the more. And uh, if you have any prayer concerns out in uh, those who are participating via the live stream, if you could put them in the chat, I'll check that. Rejoicing and giving thanks for Chris, as it will be his birthday on Thursday. I do not see any prayer concerns in the chat, so let us be together in a spirit of prayer. O oh God, we come before you on this unique day, a day when Jesus came as the bearer of peace, joy, and goodwill. And so we claim all those promises, especially for persons whose bodies are in need of healing and for persons who are lonely and need a spiritual direction. We claim your promise of peace for a land called Palestine by some and Israel by others. We pray for peace in the Ukraine. And we ask that the whole world would unite in a groundswell of blessing and goodness that we might overcome all those who choose violence, not with violence, but with love and compassion. For that's the path that Jesus walked, and as his followers, we embrace that path this day. And now we pray as we were taught, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. By way of announcement, I would share that this is Holy Week, and uh, we have two opportunities for worship during, the, during this week. On when, Thursday night here at 7.30, we'll have a service in the coffee room, and uh, it'll be an informal, casual service where we uh, observe the meaning and the events of Holy Week. And then we'll have the same service on Friday at noon in Tewksbury. So if you're from the Wilmington congregation and driving at night is difficult for you, I hope you'd come to Tewksbury at noon and worship, with, uh, worship there. And then Easter Sunday is going to be a great day. Uh, Jameson Rudd will lead us in worship. Jameson and Donegan will lead us at 6.15 at the uh, sunrise service at the town beach on Silver Lake. And then there'll be a service here at 9 and at 10.30. There'll be two different services. And Bonnie will be preaching the Easter message in, uh, for the Tewksbury congregation. And uh, Jameson and Donegan are going to go to that 9 o'clock service in Tewksbury and uh, uh, help them with a little bit of music. And Joyful Noise will be blessing us with their wonderful music at the 9 o'clock service on Easter Sunday. So it's going to be a full, rich, and wonderful day as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Are there other announcements to be shared? If so, please stand and state it, and I'll repeat it. Yes, Liz. Yes, Earth Day is coming. It's a wonderful event here in this church, and uh, everything you need to know is in the e-weekly. And uh, read that and participate. It's a, it's a great event. Thank you. Yes, Carol? April 3rd, United Women of Faith, 7 o'clock for a meeting, and there'll be an appraiser there. And again, all that information will be in the... 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. Thank you. If there are no others, I invite us to sing. Before we have, a, please be seated. Uh, before we have a, a moment to prepare ourselves for Holy Week, I would share with you one other prayer concern that I didn't notice at the appropriate time, 
But Janice DiTulio asks us to continue to pray uh, for Jim as he's healing from pneumonia. So Janice, we'll keep you in our prayers. I'd like to invite you into a ritual as we prepare uh, for Holy Week prior to today's benediction. And uh, if you have that piece of fabric, then you're going to need that for this ritual. You know, I don't know about you, but for me, Holy Week actually seems rather unholy. It's a week of humanity's self-sabotage, from glad tidings to backstabbing and arrest. And yet we know in this world that those dynamics can coexist. Glad tidings, backstabbings can happen in the blink of an eye. There's a musical called the Cotton Patch Gospel, which is a southern retelling of Jesus' story. And in that depiction of Judas, Judas is described as a friend of Jesus who was so worried about Jesus because Jesus was talking about dying and rising. Judas was a caring friend who was terrified by Jesus' words and prophecies. Judas was also vulnerable to a quick buck from the powers that be, the temptation of turning in a friend. And yet there's a part of me that thinks it was pretty rational of Judas to be worried. Did he let go of hope? Did he care so much about Jesus the man that he was blind to the miracle that he was part of creating. Without facing big disappointments, we cannot truly experience the renewal of hope that comes in seven days. One of my big disappointments today is that peace seems pretty elusive with continuing wars, human combat, and frailties. And I'm sure you have a list of disappointments in your life. In just five days, the hangings of the temple will be torn just as our hearts are torn by life's challenges and uncertainties these days. In recognition of the tears of the fabric of our lives, I invite you now to pick up one of the strips of fabric and as we say, Hosanna, which is a cry from Hebrew, save us, save us, we pray, save us now, and find the notch at one end and tear the fabric. As you tear it, the symbol of any and all big disappointments in our lives, May we release them. Hosanna. Hosanna. Release them and leave them here. As we share today's benediction and then we remain seated for the post -lude. may we go into this week assured of the promise of hope from Zechariah, from Luke, and from today. I don't understand you. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Dawn, uh, Dawn Churchill, a longtime member of our congregation, did die on Saturday morning. And I'll be talking with uh, Margaret to be scheduling his service. It's probably going to be Saturday afternoon this coming, this coming Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. In the midst of sorrow, may there be hope. Yeah. Is the benediction on the, on the slides, Ed? No. It's in the yeah. Bonnie, I'll read. Bonnie? It's in the bulletin. It's in the bu it is in the bulletin. Yeah. 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 Okay. Passing from joy into sorrow and on to elation, we come to Christ this holy week. Today is only a part of the story. Jesus' triumph leads to his death. His death leads to his resurrection. May the journey of this week lead you into the fullness of Christ's love.
Bravo.